A lot of lies were being spouted, especially on the economic issues. And this was a way of intimidating people into voting to stay in the EU. Catherine McBride is an economist. She spent her life studying and analysing financial markets and economies. Her experience and breadth of knowledge enables her to authoritatively overturn many of the myths and misrepresentations about the impacts of Brexit on the UK. The idea that everyone will move to Frankfurt is nonsense. It is complete nonsense. More people work in finance in the UK than there are people in Frankfurt. The UK market supplies 90% of wholesale financial services to the EU. We insure planes, insure engines, we insure contracts, we do catastrophe insurance, hurricane insurance, things that no one else insures, the London market insures. Who else are they going to use? Or are they just going to live without financing and live without foreign exchange and live without derivatives and live without commodity trading and all of the things we supply them with? The UK economy will be fine when we leave the EU. We will continue to buy German cars and the Germans will continue to buy financial services from the UK because neither have a competing industry themselves. One of the reasons that I really do not believe that no deal will be a disaster is because I am one of the survivors who has already lived through no deal. When I was a teenager, Australia was dumped by the UK uh, with no deal and we survived. In fact, we thrived. It was probably the best thing the UK ever did to us. We do not import anywhere near as much food as people think. Most of the base product of food, we supply 80% of our own beef, we supply 90% of our own chicken, we supply 100% of our own lamb and 100% of our own dairy. There have been all sorts of scare stories about us running out of medicine. This is also false. The UK actually sells more boxes of medicine to the EU than we buy from the EU. There's a whole lot of misinformation out there, all blamed on Brexit. The rest of the world is developing. The rest of the world has money to spend. Jump out and embrace the rest of the world. It is where it's all happening right now. I'm, I'm Catherine McBride. I um, moved to the UK 32 years ago. I studied economics at Sydney University and came here to trade in the derivative markets. I, um, oddly enough, studied the European Union in my economic degree without ever realising what a big part that would eventually play in my career. This meant that I got to really study the 12 or so European markets in some depth. But most of my customers were in the US, where most of the markets that I was selling were in the EU. So the Europeans, even then, were quite wary of buying into what they referred to as Anglo-Saxon capitalism. After I left school, I had lived in Italy for a year and learnt Italian as a student, and I'd later spent quite a lot of time in Paris. And this had enabled me to a, speak French, but also to understand the different mentalities. Most people forget that both Italy and Germany are quite new countries. They were only established in the 1870s. Um, they were originally six or seven different states that were brought together under Garibaldi in Italy and, and Bismarck in Germany, so that they they don't, even, they don't have one persona or identify as clearly as a country as maybe the UK does. Anyhow, that, uh, that knowledge ended up being incredibly useful. And then when the EU referendum came along, I found it very useful again because it intrigued me when I heard a lot of misinformation being bandied about by politicians who should have known better. And it was that anger <laughs> being slightly savant-like uh, that attracted my attention and got me involved in the whole argument. When people said that Brexit was racist, I found myself at my computer checking the, the ethnicity of every country in Europe. And I can clearly tell you that the UK, rather than being racist, is the most diversified nation in the EU by a long shot. And eight countries in the EU are basically 100% white. And that is something that people seem to keep quiet about for some reason. Suddenly anyone who didn't want EU, unlimited EU immigration, was seen as racist, which was the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. And it was little things like that that got me involved.
And the more I looked into it, the more I realised a lot of lies were being spouted, especially on the economic issues. And this was a way of intimidating people into voting to stay in the EU. And that's what I felt that the, um, the Remain campaign was doing. They were trying to scare us into not venturing out into the world. But coming from Australia, I can tell you that the rest of the world is a great place um, and much better than it was 30 years ago. Economics is an interesting, they call it a science, and it is basically describing what we do naturally. I think with all uh, professions, they develop a jargon which restricts people, keeps people out of their little group. But if you peel away e um, economic jargon, you come down to something that any person running a corner shop could probably understand because it was from describing the corner shop, the multiple corner shops, the whole country of corner shops, that someone developed the system of economics and thought about how it is that we actually run our modern society. I don't think that capitalism was invented, for instance. I'm quite sure the first caveman that bought a whole antelope home with him probably did a deal with the guy next door who happened to have a whole tree full of firewood. You know, this, this sort of thing comes naturally to us. Trading is what we do and what we, you know, you can watch two small children trading toys, saying, I'll give you this if you give me that. It's something we do without being taught. And a lot of economic thinkers began to describe this and we gave it a name, we called it economics. And now we've developed an entire theory of study around it. And I'm not sure that, that it's anything more complicated than that. For a long time, I used economics um, in a banking environment where you are trying to predict what will happen in the economy in the future and trying to predict what investments you should be buying and how you um, can protect or, or reduce your risk in that investment. The entire derivative market is about swapping risk from the person who doesn't want any risk to someone who's willing to take that risk. A farmer, for instance, is going to grow a field of cotton, but he needs to know what the price is going to be before he's going to plant. Um, so to make sure he gets that price, he can sell it in the futures market so he can sell his crop forward. And there'll be someone who wants to buy it and they'll buy that crop in the future. So they've just traded out their risk, if you like. They've made a contract before anyone's planted anything. The problem is, of course, during that time, the price of cotton might go down. And so the guy who's already bought the cotton might be disappointed. He's lost money. Um, if he'd waited, he could have got a better price. Or the price might go up and the farmer might be going, damn, if I'd waited, I could have sold it at a better price. The basis of most German financing is that the local company will go to the bank and get a bank loan, basically. And so many, many big German companies that you've heard of, household names, are still majority owned by the family that set them up. Germany is very much plain vanilla banking. If you look at the financial services, the UK market supplies 90% of wholesale financial services to the EU. The only area where we are on a par with Germany and France is in basic vanilla bank lending, where the UK, Germany and France each do about 25% of the total bank lending in the EU. And the other countries, the other 25 EU countries make up the other 25%. Now that's the only area where Germany and France are anywhere near the UK. In every other area, the UK supplies well over 50% in some areas, derivatives, forex, foreign exchange. It's 80, 90% we supply. They do not have a competing industry. They do not have people that can do what we do. The idea that the markets will all move to Germany, everyone will move to Frankfurt if we leave the EU, is nonsense. It is complete nonsense. More people work in finance in the UK than there are people in Frankfurt. You know, much more, in fact. Their Frankfurt um, is generally, people say it's about half a million 
people live there. There are more than a million people working in finance in the UK. You know, it's just not going to happen. The UK supply financial services to the rest of the EU and the world. It's not just the EU. So a lot of people also say, oh, we can't leave the EU, then we won't be able to sell to them. Well, that's not true. Um, if you actually look at what we provide, especially in places like insurance, the UK is a massive provider of insurance, but we don't so much do your general house insurance, life insurance, that sort of thing. We um, insure planes and we insure, insure engines, we insure contracts, we do catastrophe insurance, hurricane insurance, things that no one else insures, the London market insures. Why would they not use us? Because who else are they going to use? Or are they just going to live without financing and live without foreign exchange and live without derivatives and live without commodity trading and all of the things we supply them with? The other issue on that financial services is that in a lot of areas in finance, we don't go to them, they come to us. It is a bit like running a supermarket because the UK financial services markets have been so successful because they are open markets. We actually encourage banks to come and set up here. We have banks from, I think, 170 different countries around the world. So that if I'm sitting in my office and I'm doing a trade with Deutsche Bank, that doesn't mean I'm ringing someone in Frankfurt. That means I'm ringing someone in London Wall. You know, they are already here. And we're not sending them home. In fact, the Bank of England and the PRA have been fantastic in this. And they have encouraged them all to apply for UK licenses um, so that they will all be able to stay. So there is no need for us to worry about how we'll do business in the EU because the EU will come to the British financial supermarket and buy what they like from us in the same way that they do today from their office in London. And there's nothing the EU Commission can do to stop that happening. And they know that. So that any huffing and puffing about equivalence is usually coming from someone who doesn't understand how financial services are traded. Because unlike goods, a good has to get in a truck and actually go somewhere. Financial services are traded over a telephone call. The UK economy will be fine when we leave the EU. We could, if there is political will, do a very quick trade agreement because after 40 years of being in the EU, there's been a huge amount of comparative advantage has happened and industries have moved to the most efficient provider. Comparative advantage means that if something can be produced more efficiently somewhere else and you can import it for less than it costs you to make it yourself, then you naturally do it. If someone can go out to work and earn more money than it costs them to pay their cleaning lady to clean their house, then it makes sense for them to go out to work and employ someone to clean their house. If they had to employ, pay someone more than they could earn out there, then they wouldn't do that. They'd stay at home and clean their own house. So basically that's comparative advantage. That means that we will continue to buy German cars when we leave the EU and the Germans will continue, as I said, to buy financial services from the UK because neither have a competing industry themselves. Yes, we assemble a lot of cars in the UK, but they are made by German, Japanese, Indian car companies that are still based in the UK. The UK economy, um, despite what you might hear, it actually has a big internal market. We do export and import things, but it is not really as important as you might have gathered from reading the press. In fact, if our government had spent a fraction of the time worrying about exports in the last 40 years that it's spent in the last 40 months, we'd actually have a much better economy. Germany uh, relies very heavily on exports. It has an aging population who don't buy very much. And that um, means they're, they have been really caught by the trade wars between China and the US because they have grown to rely very heavily on exports. One of the reasons that I really do not believe that no deal will be a disaster is because I am one of the survivors who has already lived through no deal. When I was a teenager, Australia was 
dumped by the UK uh, with no deal. And we survived. In fact, we thrived. It was probably the best thing the UK ever did to us. Same thing happened to New Zealand. It was not great for the first few years, mainly because our governments were very myopic and tried to preserve the status quo, tried to protect the farmers, tried to protect the people who had been benefiting from selling things to the UK. In fact, our entire industry had been developed to sell things to the UK. So we sold the sort of food that the UK liked to eat. We grew the sort of apples you like to eat in the very small part of Australia that's cold enough to grow the sort of apples you like to eat. Uh, we did a whole lot of things that the UK wanted to buy from us. And it took several years before our government realised that we had to stop that. We had to A, look for new markets, and B, we had to look for new products to support those markets. Um, one of the things that I find amusing is many of the old wheat farms around Walgett in New South Wales have now become the chickpea capital of the Western world. They supply chickpeas to the hummus-eating nations of the world. Um, and I'm pretty sure in 1973, none of the farmers in Walgett would have even known what hummus was. And now they supply the chickpeas that make it. Similarly, in another area of New South Wales around Moree, um, sheep farms got converted into cotton farms and they discovered that they could actually grow incredible uh, yields and cotton because they had irrigated cotton on black soil. It was very successful cotton farms. But for years, they'd just be providing wool to be made into, sent to mills in England, made into suits that didn't even suit the Australian climate. When you think about it, a country that is basically doesn't even bother to heat their homes in winter because it doesn't get cold enough, has sheep everywhere for wool. One of the reasons we don't compete with New Zealand is because New Zealand has sheep for meat and we have sheep for wool. And you think if there's one country in the world you probably don't need to wear wool, it's Australia. Uh, but we didn't need it. We sent it to the UK. They turned it into clothes for the UK. Um, so after you dumped us, we started experimenting with cotton, which is much more suitable to our climate. Like the UK population, Australia was definitely sold what we now know to be the lie that the EU was about a trading deal. And at the time, not only were tariffs high and quotas were high, but um, transport costs were expensive. And so people could really sell this myth of the um, uh, gravity model of economics, which means that you should buy things from the closest producer. Uh, the trouble is we don't do that. We buy what we want to buy. You know, just because a country is close doesn't mean they're going to produce the stuff you want. So you end up having to buy from someone further away because they make what you want to buy. Anyhow, so I think that people in Australia were sold that idea that it made sense that Britain should trade with, um, with Europe. But I remember a lot of my parents' friends from England would come and visit us in Australia and always be shocked at the cheap price of food in Australia compared to England. But also in Australia, we had the opposite system where we did for a long time have a kind of glut of, of food because we were producing to supply a country which had three times the population of our country. So we were overproducing for our own market. So we had to find other markets. One of the things that really helped Australia is that they, um, besides dropping eventually all subsidies and all quotas, and when I was in the 70s, their first attempt after the UK left them um, was the absolutely wrong thing to do and they immediately tried to protect existing industries. They had huge tariffs on things. Imported shoes were phenomenally expensive and very strict quotas. And to import things, you had to buy the quota off the government. And so they had auctions for quotas. And they became very expensive. After about 10 years of this not working, they went the other way. In New Zealand, they dropped all of their subsidies very quickly um, because farming is private enterprise. When the New Zealand government dropped all subsidies and their economy was very heavily geared towards agricultural goods, 
a lot of people panicked. But other farmers, they made it tougher stuff. They had to find another way around it. And they developed new markets, uh, sheep farms that could no longer survive as sheep farms without the subsidies discovered that they had land that they could grow wine grapes on. And the whole New Zealand wine industry that has now been phenomenal in the last 30 years has taken over the world. Um, that all happened because they stopped subsidising unproductive sheep farms. Um, they developed the kiwi fruit ma market. Kiwi fruit is actually Chinese gooseberries. It has nothing to do with New Zealand, but they discovered they could grow it there and they marketed it internationally and you'll get kiwi fruit everywhere, and it's even called kiwi fruit. We had it in Australia as a child, and it's called Chinese gooseberry, and it has nothing to do with New Zealand, but most people think it does. One of the huge benefits of Brexit that people have overlooked is despite what we were told that if we voted to leave, the, the economy would crash and there'd be an emergency budget and interest rates would be put up, the exact opposite has happened. Instead of being 500,000 people unemployed, we've had 900,000 new jobs have been created. Um, employment's never been higher. Business has done relatively well. Um, and I'm sure one of these reasons is because the government has been so tied up with Brexit that they haven't been able to do anything bad for the economy. <laughs> they haven't actually been able to put their, cause any more problems than they've already done. Um, I truly believe that smaller government makes better business. One of the, the interesting things is the difference between the UK economy in the 70s or the world economy in the 70s and the economy today is today's economy all around the world is much more service oriented than it used to be. And so where the gravity model of economics possibly made sense in the 70s when you had expensive transport costs, it certainly makes no sense now because so much of what we sell is actually services and services are being sold down a telephone wire or services are being sold um, through the internet. Uh, so you don't actually have any transport costs in, in what we sell. The UK economy is 80% services. And it's one of the things, you know, to sell services, you're better off to have the same language and the same legal system and the same taste, maybe, um, the same sense of humor to sell a service than to be close to something. So that we will sell more services to Australia or Canada because they speak the same language, they have a similar legal system, they get the English sense of humor, they enjoy English music, they watch English films, but that is more important to have the same language than to be close. I talk a lot in high schools about international economics and I um, find the gravity model a joke. And I was looking down a list of all of the UK exports and I noticed that we sold more to Australia than we sold to Austria. Australia really couldn't get much further away from the UK and Austria is part of the EU and so we have no trade barriers whatsoever with Austria but we still buy more from Australia and then that we have no trade agreement with Australia at all while we're members of the EU as we buy more from Chile than we do from Bulgaria. Um, Bulgaria is of course in the EU, we have complete freedom of trade with Bulgaria Chile is not in the EU and we do not have a trade agreement with Chile, uh, but we bought more from them. And so the idea that you have to be close or that a trade agreement is necessary for trade is just not true. Asking children where, what sort of mobile phone they have. Nine times out of ten they have an iPhone. When you tell them that iPhones are American phones and they're made in China, and the, the software on them may be done in India, and we don't have trade agreements with any of those countries. How did they get a mobile phone, an Apple, an iPhone? Um, because they are so convinced that you must buy things with a trade agreement, which is because of our media has sold them this idea over and over and over again that we must have a trade deal to leave the EU. And yet show me someone who still has a Nokia phone. <laughs> 
I can't find, I go to schools all the time. No child has ever put their hand up and said they have a Nokia or an Ericsson for that matter. And yet we have a trade agreement with them. When you look at who we trade with in the EU, 90% of what we buy from the EU, so our imports, come from nine EU countries out of the 27 that we could buy from. So two thirds of the EU do not sell us very much. Two thirds added together is about 10% of what we buy from Europe. The other nine countries are unfortunately almost exactly the same countries that were in the EU when we joined. So a whole lot of countries have come into the EU since we joined. They all get a vote in what happens in our future and they don't even trade with us. <laughs> So, and we don't trade with them either. Our exports only go to nine EU countries as well. I find one of the reasons that I think the EU would like to tie us into to being in their customs union is when they do deals with the rest of the world, we are a huge incentive for the rest of the world to do a trade deal with the EU. As I said earlier, Germany has an aging population and they don't buy much, but they do sell a lot. So in 2017 to Canada, the UK bought 13 billion pounds worth of Canadian goods and Germany sold 13 billion pounds worth of uh, goods to Canada. So that's a trade deal. That's an EU trade deal. The UK buys, Germany sells. Um, that works out really well for Germany and for the UK. I have no problem with us buying goods that are more efficiently produced at cheaper prices from other countries. And a lot of what we buy from Canada is gold um, and we don't have the gold mines that they have, so that makes sense. But we did buy more than the next five EU countries added together. So when people say to me, if we leave the EU, we won't get a trade deal with Canada because the Canada deal is done with the EU. You have to ask them if they've ever really looked at it because I'm sure the only part of the trade deal with the EU that Canada desperately wants to hold on to is the part where they get to sell stuff to the UK. <laughs> That's the bit they want. I don't see any country really going, oh, well, we don't want to do a deal with the UK because you're only 65 million people. We are 65 million very affluent people who like to spend money. You know, <laughs> Germany may have 90 million people and they're very affluent, but they don't like to spend money because they're old. One of the joys of getting older is that people don't buy stuff. Um, I saw this happen in Japan in the 90s. I was working in a bank that did most a huge amount of business in Japan and had been hugely profitable by doing that. And it suddenly collapsed in the early 90s. And I basically... Japan and Germany didn't have the baby boom after the war that the allied countries did have because they um, they really didn't have anything to celebrate, I suppose, and they had huge repar reparations and rebuilding to do. And so their population is about 10 years older than, say, the UK's or the US's. And both of those countries did not encourage immigration either. Um, you couldn't become a German citizen you could become an itinerant worker. They used to, in the 90s, bring in workers from Turkey, but they couldn't um, become German unless they had German parentage. I remember discussing this with a German broker who I used to deal with a lot. He was intrigued to discover that people could move to England and become English, get an English passport, a British passport, because apparently at the time you couldn't do that in Germany. Um, and the same in Japan, they did not encourage immigration so that they haven't had a renewal of their population and both of them have also, like the rest of the Western world, had a declining birth rate. So that people who are young enough to have children are having smaller families or no families and the bulk of their population is getting older and older. And as you get older, you buy less stuff. You know, you don't buy a new TV because you finally worked out how to use the old one. Um, you don't buy a new car, etc. Forecasting is an interesting art and the longer you forecast for, the less accurate you are likely to be and the more assumptions you make, 
every time you assume something, you've made an error. Those errors multiply, they, they build up. And so the more assumptions you make, the more errors you've, you've made. And so to do an accurate forecast is impossible, but generally people do a shadow diagram, if you like, which stretches from one extreme of the forecast to the other. And they look at the, the most likely event and say that's what's probably going to happen. But you will find the real forecast is not the next year's economic growth will be 2%. It will actually be next year's economic growth could be anywhere between minus 1 and plus 3 or plus 5 or something. And, and people have chosen the middle range. And often they don't spell out that there is a huge range of possibilities there. With the OBR's forecast for what would happen after we leave the EU, they made some huge assumptions about the cost of exporting to the EU. They made some huge assumptions about how the EU's economy would continue to be the way it was, um, which even now uh, is completely false. They've made some huge assumptions about the elasticity of the products, which are also completely false. Um, elasticity is how much your, your purchasing changes as the price changes. So if there is a tariff added to, to that good, would you continue to buy it at the same rate as you did before? The OBR is forecasting that in 15 years time, our economy would be 6% lower than they think it would have been had we voted to stay in the EU. A long forecast is worthless, quite frankly, because the longer the time of the forecast, the more likely it is to be wrong. But in that forecast, they also assumed a couple of things that are completely wrong, and we know that. One thing they assumed is that the government would do nothing about it. Even with the Fixed Term Parliament Act, 15 years is three different governments. And the idea that things would go wrong and the same government would stay in power and continue to do the same thing for 15 years is nonsense. They have also assumed that there are no changes in the economy of the EU. Now, we already know that since they made that forecast, the Italian economy has gone into recession. The German economy is hovering above recession and the European Central Bank is threatening to have to, to start quantitative easing again. So the idea that you can say that the EU economy will be fine for the next 15 years is already rubbish. It was probably a stupid idea when they made the forecast, but it holds no water now. And they've also assumed that we will not trade more with the rest of the world, even though the rest of the world is doing incredibly well, probably booming um, by comparison to Europe. And there is no reason why we wouldn't sell into other markets more. They have assumed that we will stop trading EU products and the EU will stop buying our products, even though there is no alternative supplier for UK goods. We have basically do different things. Our competitive industry has died. Our steel industry has disappeared. Italy's has gone better. German cars have gone up. Our cars have gone down. Our financial services have gone up. Theirs have disappeared. You know, we, we, we don't really compete in any area, and I don't see us competing in the future. Uh, because that's not where the world's competition is. The world's competition is outside of Europe. We do not import anywhere near as much food as people think. Most of the base product of food, we supply 80% of our own beef, we supply 90% of our own chicken, we supply 100% of our own lamb and 100% of our own dairy. We do import 40% of our pork from Europe and we import 50% of our vegetables from Europe. But pork and vegetables can be imported from all sorts of countries around the world, and they are more efficient providers, and they are, uh, will be cheaper for us to import. A friend of mine who's an environmentalist actually tells me it would be more friendly to the environment to fly vegetables in from Kenya that have been ripened in the environment than to bring them in from the Netherlands where they're ripened in heated glasshouses. You can source food from pretty much anywhere 
and it will be cheaper and better than food sourced from the EU. Beef coming in from Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, Australia, it's cheaper than EU beef. Not that expensive to import. It, it ages on its travelling time. You know, the best beef in the world is aged beef, 30 days, and that's about the time it will take to, to put it into a container and take it from Brazil to the UK. There have been all sorts of scare stories about us running out of medicine. This is also false. The UK actually sells more boxes of medicine to the EU than we buy from the EU. The pharmaceutical industry is a massive multinational industry. It is sold around the world mainly tariff-free because there is no government in the world that wants to add tariffs onto medicines. No deal will be fine. Um, it is not a big problem. For a start, there is no such thing as no deal. Uh, we would leave and work on WTO terms for any trading we did uh, with any country where we don't have a trade agreement. We have already rolled over most of the trade agreements that were signed between the EU and other nations. Uh, we already have signed over the deals that are not about trade in terms of, say, um, aircraft landing rights or flight paths over the country, things like that. We have already made an agreement on how we will handle visitors and tourist traffic. Most countries don't form customs unions and single markets with their trading partners to do trade. Most trade is bought um, by people that don't have the same rules, don't have the same regulations. And if the product doesn't meet their rules, they don't let it in. It's very simple. Uh, we have exactly the same rules as any EU market. The idea that they wouldn't let our products in seems a bit crazy, especially as they don't have a competing product in most cases. Unlimited labour benefits multinationals. You have completely destroyed the bargaining power of the indigenous workforce when you can replace them in a nanosecond with someone from a country with a lower standard of living and lower wages. UK wages are two and a half times Bulgarian wages after tax and after cost of living is taken into account. So we can't be too surprised when a huge number of people will come across from Bulgaria or Romania or Lithuania or Latvia. And we have taken their, their young people, we have taken their 20 to 40 year olds who are generally very well educated, generally work in jobs in the UK that they're overqualified for. But right now, the UK pays about 10 billion pounds to the EU every year to be a member of this club. And yet, when you look at the goods and services that we export to the EU, even at the current tariff rate, if they applied tariff, we would actually end up only paying them about 5 billion pounds in tariffs. But those tariffs would be paid for by the companies, where right now the money paid to the EU is paid by the taxpayer. So really the taxpayer is subsidising a whole lot of large multinationals who get to trade into the EU at our expense, free of charge. They also get to import a workforce from the EU. I find it terrifying that members of our Marxist opposition stand up and say we need to be in the EU for workers' rights. When you have unlimited supplies of labour, there are no workers' rights because there is always someone who will work for less and you can always be replaced. So you have no collective bargaining power. That's not an EU competency. It's done, each nation gets to set its own workers' rights. So the idea that it comes from the EU is not right. There are five or six EU countries where they have no minimum wage and they are not... Estonia or Bulgaria, they are Italy and Sweden and Finland do not have a minimum wage. Denmark doesn't have a minimum wage. The UK has higher holiday time. They have longer maternity leave. Uh, they have um, anti-discrimination um, laws, a whole lot of stuff that have come from the UK and have absolutely nothing to do with the EU. Meanwhile, the EU, through the free movement of people, destroys collective bargaining so that wages have been flat in so many sectors for a long time. Mm -hmm.
you will often hear Jeremy Corbyn say that the NHS would collapse. Now, this is wrong for two reasons. A, it won't collapse because we actually only get 5.5% of our NHS staff from the EU. But at the same time, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be training our own people. And it is horrific to me to know that the NHS actually plans to take 10% of its workforce from other countries. Because many times the other countries that have trained their own doctors and their own nurses are quite impoverished countries that cannot afford to be training people only to watch them leave and go to the UK. Certain countries in the EU should be jumping for joy because they might be able to hold on to a few more of their educated people and get them to actually develop businesses or hospitals or teachers or whatever in their own countries. Um, after the Greek economy collapsed, 9,000 Greek doctors left Greece. They didn't all come to the UK. A lot of them went to Germany and other countries. And though only 5.5% of NH staff come from the EU, we have 9.5% of our doctors come from the EU and 6.4% of our nurses come from the EU. And that is not good for them. It might be great for us, but it's really bad for them. And it intrigues me that so many UK people only look at it from their point of view and say, the NHS will collapse. And you're going, no, it won't. And shouldn't you be training your own doctors? Media, oddly enough, has been completely insulated. How would Nick Robinson feel about the EU if the head of the BBC rang up and said, oh, we're, we've found this guy, got a lovely accent, went to school in England, and um, he'll work for a third of your price, <laughs> so we're going to replace you. Suddenly, everyone on the BBC would be up in arms and they would be going, oh, we can't possibly do that. And I think if that started to happen, media would change its tune automatically. They would suddenly understand what's been happening in factories and shops all over the country. Firms have not needed to train their own staff. They have been able to bring in staff from other countries that are already trained who will often work for less than a UK equivalent person. In a phone call that was held with our Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Business Secretary and the Brexit Secretary after the first withdrawal agreement was voted down by the House of Commons by 230 votes. Some large multinationals all wanted no deal taken off the table. And they were all people who employ a lot of people in very boring jobs. People who pack shelves in supermarkets at night from midnight to six in the morning or work in, in the Amazon warehouses packing shelves. When you read the transcript of that, which was published by The Telegraph in January last year, it is shocking to see big, big companies for which the UK as a whole is a tiny part of their international revenue asking for no deal to be taken off the table. It would make almost no difference to their overall returns uh, if they had to pay a tiny amount of tariff on what they import or export. It would make no difference probably if they had to pay a little bit more to the staff that they employed. And yet they still had the audacity to ask the Chancellor to take no deal off the table. And it intrigues me that the Chancellor thought that was a good idea. And you have to question whose side are they on? Because I don't actually have a problem with the businesses. Businesses should be demanding that. I do have a problem for politicians that are elected to look after the country and represent the, the people of the country who give in to big business in this way without questioning their motivation. One of the things that is talked about a lot has been about uh, introducing an Australian point system of immigration. And um, I find that one of the best things that one of our, our conservative government did was put a very big wall around Australia for immigration. And while a lot of people think that's not fair, we actually have more immigrants or a similar amount of immigrants as the UK has in its high years 
about 300,000 people will come into Australia each year. We bring in the ones we want. And this is only about them having the right skills to fill a need in our economy. And one of the benefits of that has been that um, we've kept wages very high. And that means that it is a much more level economy than the UK. Even cleaning ladies can afford to live in an apartment and, and buy clothes. We don't have houses in, like here in London, in Ealing, you'll find houses where occasionally the, the council finds there's a five or six bunk beds in every room. That doesn't happen in Australia. Because they restrict the immigration, we do not have that unskilled immigration coming in. Um, and it's been a huge benefit for the economy. We've had 28 years of economic growth. And I put that down to the fact that everyone can afford to, to live. You know, everyone is getting paid enough. By restricting immigration, you can keep wages high. High wage country is a high growth economy. You know, people forget about the fact that by not paying people enough, you might be better off personally, but that in the long run it gets you because they can't then afford to buy your, your goods. You actually need customers as much as you need um, laborers. And if you're, Henry Ford worked this out many years ago, he wanted everyone who worked in his factory to be able to become one of his customers. Australia has created an indigenous customer base by paying people enough so that they can live. And it's actually improved productivity as well. We have very high productivity in Australia because employing people is expensive. And so factories will make sure that they get, you know, people work hard and they'll uh, put the investment into capital equipment that in the UK people don't bother to invest in because it may be cheaper to just get five labourers from Eastern Europe rather than buy a machine that could do the same task. The younger generations are in a double whammy situation because A, a lot of companies will not train them because it is much cheaper to bring in a trained person from Eastern Europe a lot of younger people will have trouble progressing through a company because the company are less inclined to train them. They are also having problems where they have not the collective bargaining that people had here in, say, the 70s and the 80s when there were massive strikes, um, and that forced up wages and forced up working conditions um, because we were down at that stage. We had 2% unemployment. Um, and that put the power definitely into the employees' hands. Well, that will never happen for the younger generation of English people because the power will, it'll take a long time before the power is back in their hands again. Wages at the lower end of the economy is not, are not growing and not keeping pace with a lot of other costs. It's going to be very difficult for them to buy a house. The growth of markets outside Europe is phenomenal. Um, the, the Asian group predict that in 10 years' time, two-thirds of the world's middle-class people will be living between the Indian subcontinent and the Pacific Ocean. A lot of noise has been made about car companies leaving the EU because of Brexit. That's not why they're leaving. If you look at Honda's results, they clearly tell you that their biggest profitable, most profitable area is selling motorbikes in Indonesia, not selling cars in London. Um, the same thing is true of pretty much everyone. China bought 10 times as many cars last year as the UK did. And in two years, China bought more cars than there are in the UK. You know, so anyone wondering why a car company is moving its production line back to Japan to sell into the Chinese market should only look at the numbers. There's a whole lot of misinformation out there, all blamed on Brexit because people are not leaving the EU and discovering what's happening in the rest of the world. The rest of the world is developing. The rest of the world has money to spend. Jump out and embrace the rest of the world. It is where it's all happening right now.